on the issue. But in the US, it's been done and done successfully. Now authorities in Britain have cleared the way for the use of stem cells on a case-by-case -case basis. My guests today take opposite views. Dr. Mohamed Taranisi is director of the Assisted Reproduction and Technology Center in London. Dr. Richard Nicholson edits the Bulletin of Medical Ethics. Should ethics intervene in saving lives? Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. Richard Nicholson, a young lady in the States called Molly Nash is alive and well today because of stem cells received from her baby brother. Would you have denied her access to those stem cells? Yes, I would. So you would have wanted her to die? Well, you can look at it in a very narrow sense and say yes for that but individual person. But that's what person. the result would have been, wouldn't that it? That would, Quite yes. possibly. And that's the same result as happens to an awful lot of children around the world. Today, You're content to pass a death sentence then on a, I'm on a child? I'm not passing a death sentence. I'm saying that there are certain interventions which it is not ethical to undertake and which should not be the priorities of a modern society. Even if it saves the life of a child? You would have been prepared to say to the parents... It makes it a great parents. deal, it makes it a great deal less likely that we will ever get round to doing something to save the 20,000 children's lives which will be lost today around the world from entirely preventable likely? diseases. Why less likely? Because Molly Nash is alive today. Because it's part of a research process in rich countries which is designed to do everything possible for the individual and which skews medical research so that in WHO's terms 90 percent of medical research nowadays worldwide is done on less than 10 percent of the global disease burden. Most of the important killing diseases have no re serious research being done into them. So you're saying just because she's a rich kid she should survived? I'm That's in effect what you're saying, isn't it? I don't think the richness or anything else comes well, in. You drew attention to the fact that, that it, it, the cost and, and the resources are going into yeah, rich that, kids' treatment. Sure, but that's not the you're only... You're raising the that's issue That's not here. the only argument. The other argument, the other part of the argument, is what it is doing to the way that we regard human beings. You know, you've mentioned Molly, who would otherwise have died, but what about... And you about, would have been prepared. Can I, just, her, can I just... What about her sibling? But can I, what about her sibling? Her sibling's the alive one who's and been, well today. Yeah, the one who's been brought up to... who's been created in order to be used for an older brother or sister. Now, a by that... Product, a byproduct of the creation. You can't just say that was the only reason this child is here. But you don't was, know. You haven't spoken to the parents, have you? Sure, it's not the only reason, but it's certainly a primary reason. Well, parents like to choose the reasons uh, why they have yes. children, don't they? You wouldn't want to take that away from them? No, I wouldn't, but I wouldn't necessarily want um, high-tech medical science to be involved in order to achieve that particular choice. You know, we can have I just, to, can I just is, be is clear about this before, before we turn yeah. to Dr. Taranisi, that you, in this case, would have been prepared to say to the Nashes, the parents, that really, although there is a clear chance of saving your daughter's life, I really don't want to do it. You would have been prepared to say that. Yes, I would be prepared Pretty to say it. But people looking at this will think, what are you, some kind of monster here? No, I'm somebody who's asking, what are the wider implications of what we're doing? What are the wider implications of the research going on into assisted reproduction and ways of manipulating what sort of child is going to be born. You know, that case, okay, where one has had a sibling who has benefited greatly, but do we make our decisions on the very few cases? Do we say that we should change our attitudes to how we regard human beings? on the basis that we can save one or two people And you don't disease. think the many in the end will benefit from the experience no, of the few? No, of course few. they won't, because... The of course they won't, they have in the past. If it's, if it's, pi if it's pioneering science, it is, the many will benefit, yeah, won't they? But Dr. if you Tarnese. look, you have to come ask about the science, because the chances of success are pretty small, and the costs of doing it are pretty large. Dr. And so very few are going to benefit. Can we, can we just come to you and ask you whether the, the many will in the end benefit from the pioneering well, science used on the few. Well, I think the question here and the argument, as far as I can tell, it is going to the principle of medicine altogether, because if this argument is to stand, then you shouldn't really treat anybody. You shouldn't use any technology to try and help people sort of 
be cured no, from their diseases and so on. Yeah, but what I'm just trying to say as well, in, in these particular cases, I mean, people seem to start on the wrong footing because all these babies are created because the family wants another baby to start with. I mean, people make it sound like, okay, this baby has only been created for this particular purpose, which is the wrong assumption. These families wanted a baby, and if this baby can be, in addition to that, have the right kind of genes that will help an affected baby, I don't see any ethical problem with that. What is wrong with that? If that you don't accept, do you? Because no, but let me just tell you another thing. If there was another baby now who is existent in the family, and we did the test on this baby, and we find out that this baby is the right match, what the situation would be then? Would you have a problem with that, Dr. Nicholson? No, I would not have a problem with that. Well, and that is what, a, what has been done already. But you in would have some a problem. Case, but you perceive the motives of the parents to be in having a new child. That's, that's where your problem yes, lies. and because the science is going one stage further than has been allowed previously, because previously in antenatal diagnosis we've looked at whether particular embryos, fetuses, have major abnormalities. And if they do, then in many countries, abortion is permissible. Likewise, with pre-implantation diagnosis, where we look at the embryo and see if it's carrying a particular genetic fault, um, because that genetic fault has already occurred in the family, we are preventing the development of a fetus with a major abnormality. But in this case, we're going beyond that. We're saying not only do we not want the embryo to have that genetic fault, we want to make sure that that embryo is a perfect tissue match for the sibling already existing. So we're going from um, a negative view of preventing some serious abnormality to saying now we can look for something positive and we'll only allow this embryo to um, be developed. Can I, can, I, can I just come back to your attitudes to parents and, and parents' motives? I mean, you say, Dr. Taranisi, that uh, the parents want a child and then comes the consideration of whether it can help a sick sibling. You say that parents shouldn't actually be choosing in that way. It's not up to, let's face it, it's not up to a couple of doctors, whatever your views are, to say what parents should or should be motivated by in wanting yeah. children, is it? It's none of your business, is it? In one sense, no, but there are experience already with a variety of different ways of doing assisted reproduction is that, okay, the first one or two cases, everybody seems to have the highest motives and one can be sure that everything will work out fine. And then a bit further down the road, a year or two later, for slightly different reasons, we have um, couples having children who then, oh, something's wrong with it and they just um, give it away for adoption or there are great but court arguments. It doesn't happen arguments. very often, does it? Relative to the number of children produced by these artificial techniques, yes, it happens very often. Isn't that a risk, no, Dr. Turner? I, I, I don't agree with this at all, because I don't think it's, it's good enough to say because in the future sometime you may have some misuse of the technology, then you should have to ban the technology altogether. I think that's the wrong attitude. I mean, okay, the technology will always have a downside to it. It's up to the society and the, the government body that regulates this kind of technology to make sure that you have safeguards so that this technology is only used for the best, uh, and best interests of people. The government has safeguards, but you don't have any limit you're prepared to do, do you? You don't recognize any society limits. No, I do recognize. That's the wrong assumption. I mean, what, 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 limits, what limits do you recognize then? If you're prepared, as I think you suggested earlier on, to do anything in the pursuit of saving a life, well, well, what, what are your limits then? Well, I mean, we still work with, from within the limits of the society and the government body. I mean, we haven't said that we're going to just break all the rules and just go and do anything we like. I mean, we've had a, a view on this particular technique. It took the HFA longer to see this, but they've come round and they've accepted that what the Human around, Fertilization and Embryology Authority, that's correct, HFA. Yeah. I mean, they have seen what we, we've seen two years ago. It took them two years to see the obvious, but they've, they've seen it now. But there is a case where you are overseeing the care of a woman who had an embryo planted in the United States and she's due to give birth in London in February. The clinic is expecting to carry out the procedure to use blood from the umbilical cord to save the son who has leukemia. That's right. Now in theory, the way has been cleared legally for that to go ahead, but the HFEA hasn't decided whether it will. You who say you're prepared to work within the system have also said you don't care whether they give their assent or not. You'll no, go ahead and do I, no, it. No, I didn't say that. What I said 
sort of legally speaking, the HFE has no sort of power on the test that you can run on cells taken from an embryo. They have power to regulate what you do as an embryo, which is basically giving you a license to take a cell from the embryo. What you do with this cell is not actually sort of under the restriction no, of the No, but if they prevent you from going ahead with this, you'll obey the rule, will you? Of course. You will? Yeah, of course. You won't risk prosecution? No, I won't risk prosecution, but I don't think it will come to that as well. But if it does, you're prepared to the system here? Of course, like anybody else. You have said you couldn't care less about safeguards. You've said it's not up to me, not my rule to ensure, my role to ensure safeguards. Why not? No, no, I, I never said I don't care. I mean, I... I, I you said I, it's not up to you, though, and it's not your role to ensure safeguards. Well, it's, it's not up to me as a clinician, okay? We, I mean, I can, I can sort of do what I think is right in a, in a clinical situation, but I cannot enforce my views on other clinicians. So I may have some rules and regulations that I abide by, but this is no sort of guarantee that other people will do the same. This particular lady that we have treated, I know very well that she wanted to have a baby. And the reason for this is, when we select the embryo and put it back, we can give her something like 97, 98% guarantee that the baby is gonna be the right match. You are required to do some extra tests in the early stages of the pregnancy to confirm that your diagnosis is right. She didn't want to do this test because if the result of the test was negative, this is the wrong match, she wouldn't have gone for termination. So this is again an indication that she really wanted this baby, regardless of whether at the end of the day is going to be the exact match or not. Dr. Nicholson, why are you not satisfied with the safeguards laid out by the HFEA? I mean, they're, they're pretty detailed, case-by-case -case basis, aren't they? They are, but I don't believe that the HFEA, the Fertilisation Authority in the UK, has taken a serious look at the ethical issues. They say they in, have. They say they have, and I have read the report from their ethics committee, it's here on the desk, and it says that the issue of looking at positive features, such as whether the um, embryo has the right HLA um, typing. HLA is what? This is... I don't uh, want to get... Here, Fine. Th this is what you look at to see whether you've got a tissue match or not. Um, so looking we at whether there's the proper um, sort of tissue which will match the existing sibling. But what, about the, new, what about the ethical sibling? They say that here. raises no new problem, and it very obviously does. And so their decision is based on faulty reasoning by their own ethics committee. Your, now, fear, your fear is of designer babies, isn't it? Yes, but they are specifically ruling out gone, designer babies. They say we would always reject yes, applications for designer babies that parents want to choose. But you can't, you can't make that. Uh, you know, the, the history of assisted reproduction in the last 20 years has been a gradual shifting of the barriers by the clinicians without any real input from society. Why do you say that society, this is what society changes, doesn't it? Society develops. Sure. What but is acceptable where, where now we, wasn't acceptable Where do we 30, have 40, the real social ago? discussion? Where do we have the real ethical discussion? In places like by, this, for instance. But not very often. And usually, you know, you have just an ethics committee who don't even name themselves on their documents. You say an ethics committee, they are made decision. up of, of, of philosophers, journalists, a bishop, doctors, lawyers. Yeah, what and they've want? ignored the central issue, which is that this goes a step further than anything pre that's been done previously. And that's happened time and again with HFEA, with, the, with our supposed safeguards in this country. Now, one of the real problems with assisted reproduction is that we look for side effects on a very short-term basis. We look at it as if this was um, experimentation with a new drug and we only have to look for side effects or ill effects of the procedures for a week or two or a month or two. Actually, what we're dealing with is the whole process of human um, regeneration and procreation. Well, you're which, wide, you're which is you're widening it to that which is extent, generation. Aren't, you, aren't you widening it and spreading alarm unnecessarily? Dr. Tony, no, isn't it? I'm, I'm saying that one's got to look at a great deal more than just one organization's consideration of this uh, because the side effects may be uh, things that appear in future generations and not something which necessarily appears immediately. Dr. Taranisi, you want to come in? The, the term designer baby is completely misleading to people because we're not actually designing any babies here. I mean, these embryos develop into the lab 
at random. It's exactly what we do with IVF treatment for the last 22, 23 years. All what we're doing here is basically just doing an extra test on the embryo just to make sure that, okay, we, we're looking for whatever we want to look for. So designer baby is just giving people the wrong impression. It just gives you the, the feeling that you sit there and manipulate genes and, and, and just control Ember is going to look like at the end of but the day. But that's what Dr. Nicholson fears is going to come out well, it's of this, not, don't it, you? No, it's not, well, it's in not anywhere near. We are moving slowly down the slippery slope, if you like. It's a slow progress. Well, you're shaking, you're shaking it's, your head. It, but it's not happening and it's not even sort of round the corner. This, this is not going to be in our lifetime and it's just talking in series here. This is not something that is available and it's not going to be available in the foreseeable future. What's your interest in this? I mean, you run a clinic, you run a business. Yes, is it, of course. It's, it's, it's making money, isn't it, it? I mean, this is again taking the issue of science into sort of finance which is again the wrong assumption because why not i mean you are no, making money you, we are making money but not out of this because at the very best you're going to have two or three cases a year do you think a business is going to run on two or three it's cases it's not going a year? to run on this alone but if the demand is there as richard nicholson no. seems to think it will be the demand will will mushroom no. if if the results are successful well the results are successful i mean the, there are two cases now that are successfully and it's not just number that we're looking for because you you're treating here situations of life and death even if you do one case a year to me that's good enough to to to, to have this technology available to them but a pgd will cover a lot of other things this is just one application of the whole treatment but there are risks i mean even lord winston who's a fertility expert he says there's little chance of this technology working the notion that you could successfully carry out the procedure is so small as to raise parents hopes unreasonably do wrong. you do you raise parents hopes unreasonably no, what do you no. tell them what will Wait, you tell them the fact of the matter is these people have been successful and had babies so for someone to say that it's not right and it's not very successful i don't think he is he's really correct in saying this because he, has, he hasn't been sort of involved in this kind of cases. And I'm sure where did he get the success rates from? We've done it, we've seen it with the people who've done it, and we know it does work. You have to remember as well that these people are not actually infertile couple. So their success rate with these people should be much, much, much higher from someone who's actually going through IVF because they have on top of that another fertility problem. Richard so Nicholson, how, how far are ethics lagging behind? these new developments in your view? Quite a long way right behind because medical research is no longer primarily done for the benefit of mankind, for finding generalizable how, how you, knowledge. How can you say something like that? Who's, whose because benefit is it done for then? Prime, well, for two um, groups of people. One for the researchers who make money and get career advancement out of it. Well, only if they and succeed, secondly, don't they? Only if and they succeed. secondly, for the shareholders of drug companies. The amount of is done purely because people have a genuine interest in finding out new information that will be of wide value to mankind is probably only about five percent. But who would, put, who would put the money into it if it wasn't the drug companies? Governments don't put enough in to get new drugs out. Well, the Do new... They? This is a totally different argument, no, but actually but pharmaceutical, you, but you, but, but you pharmaceutical, it. Yes, but you pharmaceutical it, companies at the moment are hardly producing any worthwhile new drugs. They're in crisis. Um, why do you think we've had all these enormous mergers? They're actually the producing a little less than 40% of the new drugs on the market. So it's, it's not an insignificant sure. figure, yeah. is it? But of course, they're drugs for the wealthy, chronically ill people of the rich countries. Well, not they are not the information after, no, no. after the patent one, one period is, the is, new... is available for everybody, isn't it? After 18 yeah. months, the, the only, information is available four, to everybody. Only four drugs out of the last 1,200 to be put on the market worldwide have been of any use in any of the major killing tropical diseases. You know, the pharmaceutical industry isn't interested in that because there isn't money for them. Okay, so money is one of the prime reasons for doing medical research nowadays. If scientists genuinely were interested in benefiting mankind, they would not feel they had to rush ahead with all their new procedures as fast as they can. They would allow time for society and for those who consider the ethics to keep up. You don't believe but that, Dr. Terenisi, do you? You believe he's just sticking in the mud. I, I just feel that at the end of the day the, the principle of medicine is to try and help people prevent disease cure disease. But what if the, ethics, first, I, I what if the ethics the first aren't principle debated? is first do no harm. Ever since yes. Hippocrates the primary principle has been first do no harm. 
uh, well, what would you like to answer that? How much harm we're going to be doing because we haven't had the time to assess. Can you answer the question what is, of harm? what is unethical about uh, treating people who are ill? Why this is an unethical approach? And what harm are you doing and to whom? I mean, you are helping somebody who can be dead because there is no treatment available to them. You are bringing happiness, joy, and, and, and everything that is good in a situation that is hopeless. Why should this be unethical? Because you are beginning to use human beings as a means to somebody else's benefit, well, you are not doing as ends in themselves. You are doing, once you you're move treating them down, as commodities. No, you're as a, a, treating them as, as commodities. Fact. And once you start moving down that path, then there's no telling how far society will decide to go. And how, but can you, you answer know, that, can you answer yes, that, can. Warwick? Then, then why should you accept sort of organ transplant between sort of brother and sister? And parents, so people donate a kidney to, to, a, to a brother or to a, a son or whatever. Why this is ethically okay, but uh, doing because it Because they in this haven't way. been specifically created for that purpose. And the HFEA makes quite clear that they would not, the, the Fertilization Authority in the UK makes clear that they would not wish But again, that you're treading into new... parents' motives. That's what again, I'm saying. you're treading into parents' motives, where quite frankly, many well, people it's parents say, it's who just make... not the business of doctors it's to be pontificating up... about parents' sure, motives. But parents make up society, and if their attitudes are increasingly permitted to move towards human beings becoming just objects for other people's use, then this is a very dangerous place. But you hear parents for say, for instance, I've, I've got a son, I, I want a sister for him, I want to have company. What, what's wrong with that? That's only, that's only a step away saying, I'm going to have another child because it may be able to help the life of the one I've already got. It's only I a think, step no, away. No, it's isn't a great it? deal more. The commodification goes much deeper than that in this situation where one is specifically looking for the genes in the embryo you're creating. And what you were saying earlier, and quoting from Robert Winston about the potential lack of success, has to be true. I mean, if you're, most of these serious disorders are likely to be autosomal recessive, as the geneticists would call them. And your likelihood of having an embryo which both doesn't carry that gene and carries a necessary tissue match gene is one in 16. Now, I mean, 16 is a good number of eggs to harvest at any one um, egg collection by assisted reproducers. One, so, of, what, one of the things, Dr. Nicholson, that this discussion shows up, the ethical debate surely has not kept up. We should have had these arguments long ago, shouldn't we, Dr. Taranisi? Well, I mean, they will always have this kind And you of should debate. have been involved in them, really. Did you come in, to me two instead years of, ago instead of, instead of washing your hands of them, shouldn't you? No, I'm not washing my hands of it, but I think, I mean, we also have a right to look at things, not just the medical side of it. I mean, we are part of the society and, and we look at the Essex and what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. We may have different views, but it doesn't mean that we don't take these views into consideration when we make our decisions. Mohamed Taranisi, Richard Nicholson, thank you both very much for being with us. Thank you.